Welcome to this third webinar of the Klingendal Russia and Eastern Europe Center on a country that doesn't often enough make it into the Dutch, in, in fact, to the international media, which is Belarus, because there's really a lot going on in the run-up to the presidential elections taking place on the 9th of August in uncharacteristically tense times in Belarus. President Lukashenko, who's been in power for now 26 years, has rarely faced this much domestic opposition to his rule. We've seen protests earlier in Belarus in 2010 and in 2015, but now the temperature seems to have risen to a new level. And that calls into question what might happen in the coming summer. Uh, Belarus has not had the type of color revolution that we've seen in Ukraine, in Georgia, Kyrgyzstan, Moldova, or even Armenia. Uh, but here there's an interesting situation when we've just heard that the uh, Central Election Commission has not registered one of the key opponents to Lukashenko, Viktor Babarika, who is already detained, but now also will not be able to run in the presidential elections. So now is a very good moment to bring together three experts on Belarus to discuss a couple of things. First of all, the, the domestic situation in Belarus, the, the changing mood in Belarusian society, and the stability or, or lack thereof of the rule of Lukashenko, but also the relations between Belarus and the Russian Federation, which have changed over the last years and not for the better. And thirdly, the question what this means for us in the EU and what options we have to engage with Belarus if we face a dilemma between on the one hand trying to protect the human rights of people in Belarus, but on the other hand, also offering Belarus an option to engage more closely with Europe. So these are the topics for our discussion today. And I would be honored to introduce to you the three panelists, and then I'll give you a couple of points on housekeeping, on how the webinar works for those of you who are new to our webinar, uh, and then we'll delve straight into the discussion. So our first expert is Rigor Astapenia, who is a Robert Bosch uh, Stiftung Fellow at Chatham House at the Russia and Eurasia Program, but before that actually set up an NGO in Belarus called the Center for New Ideas, which focused on democratic reforms. Rigor, so there's a lot to discuss on the matter of democratic reforms. A second expert is Olga Drindova, who is affiliated with the University of Bremen and editor of the Belarus Analysis German publication, but has also published a lot on youth policy, on civil society in Belarus and on many other issues. And he'll be able to give us a good insight uh, on the mood within Belarusian society at the moment. And a third expert is our very own Klingendal Institute associate, senior associate, Tony van der Tocht, who is also a Dutch diplomat and who focuses in his research on geopolitics, on EU-Eurasian Union relations, on Russia and Eastern Europe in general, and who has written for us at the Klingendal Institute an interesting piece called The Belarus Factor a couple of years ago. And my name is Bob Dane, and I have the honor of being the coordinator of the Klingendal Russia and Eastern Europe Center, which was founded in May, and I'm a senior fellow at the security unit at Klingendal. Now, a couple of practical points. We have split the audience into two groups. Those of you that are in the Zoom can participate actively, hopefully, in the discussion itself. You have a Q&A button at the bottom of your screen where you can ask your questions. I will keep an eye on those questions. And then I will unmute, uh, unmute you and you'll be able to ask the question yourself to the experts. Those of you that are watching us on YouTube, unfortunately, you can't join into the discussion. But if you register on our website, then you can be in the Zoom next time. So let me, that be an encouragement. And also a little commercial break. The next webinar will be after the summer break on the 10th of September, when we'll be discussing US-Russia relations, the place of the EU within that, on security issues in particular. That will be with Andrei Kartunov of the Russian International Affairs Council, Heather Conley, and our very own Dick Zande, the head of the Klingendal Security Unit. So without further ado, let me move into the first topic for discussion, which is the domestic political situation. And then regard the question will come to you, if you could set the scene for us, because in one of your recent publications, you wrote that Lukashenko faced some challenges before, but the foundations of his rule are no longer as stable as they used to be. Uh, and he seems to certainly be worried uh, if he's actually deregistering and jailing candidates. Then, uh, and if the police is indeed cracking down on people on the streets of Minsk, uh, then he might certainly be worried, but he might also be willing to go all the way to preserve power. So could you give us a little bit of an assessment of the stability of the regime and the main problems that it faces, both in the short term and the run up to the elections, but also beyond. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. Good afternoon, everyone. Well, the 
Lukashenko's regime is still stable. It's nervous, but it's still stable. And actually, there are no signs that the government will stop following Lukashenko's orders or that the security agencies will not conduct massive repressions. But many things have changed in Belarus. And I will just mention four main changes, just like in the next four minutes. First of all, today Lukashenko has a low approval rating. And uh, while he has hit his statistical lows before, it never happened during the election campaign. And it really feels like a part of a long-term trend rather than a temporary occurrence. In, in April, the public opinion poll, which is state-funded, uh, showed that only 24% of Minsk dwellers trusted Lukashenko. And uh, taking into account Lukashenko's irresponsible response to COVID-19 pandemic and taking into account massive repressions, it seems very likely that the electoral rating across the whole country is close to this figure. In a way, it, he proved it, he, that himself today while he registered Viktor Babarika. The second important change is the strong involvement of citizens uh, in politics in June small actions or large actions took place across the whole country, even in small towns where just like 10,000 citizens live. And there are a few reasons why people uh, became more involved in Belarusian politics. It's not just their disappointment with the Belarusian economy, it's also the irresponsible, irresponsible response to COVID-19 and also massive repressions. So, and also what is important here is that in nearly entire generation of Belarusians grew without experience of police brutality and massive repressions. And it's kind of one of the features of Belarusian politics is that when level of uh, repressions decrease, so the number of people who would like to prote protest increase. So <clears throat> uh, the last huge uh, repression, wave of repressions took place in 2010. And there were smaller waves in 2017 and after, but still there is really a lot of people who are like, are not afraid, at least they were not afraid a month ago, who would like to participate in Belarusian politics. One more reason for people's great involvement is that media landscape in Belarus has changed. Social media and non-state media were never so popular as as now and actually censorship in state media is not a problem for alternative candidates because they can reach the society through other channels for example victor babarika has like almost 300,000 followers on instagram so they really can reach the society through their own channels and also through the crowdfunding they can financially mobilize to pay fines to organize street actions or just like write angry comments together. Uh, the appearance of new alternative candidates as Viktor Babarika, as uh, Valery Tsipkala, as uh, Svetlana Tsikhanovskaya, the third huge change that I should mention, it's like, because these people are outsiders uh, from the traditional Belarusian opposition. So uh, their biographies better resonate with the Belarusian society. And that's why these people, people would like to follow new leaders. By the end of the day, Viktor Babarika collected almost half a million signatures in a month without significant financial resources. It would be a massive political success in every European country. And the fourth change and the last change that I would like to mention is the lack of any positive agenda of Lukashenko. He actually promises nothing but just to keep the, the things the way they are. And his recent appointments also show that actually he has no plans to reform the country after the election. For example, in June, Sergei Rumas, who is a relatively economic liberal, uh, has lost his post of prime minister and the security officer, uh, Roman Golovchenko, took it. And uh, I will also probably mention the fact that actually this lack of positive agenda is to some extent related to the tactics that Belarusian authorities used during this election is just like punishing everyone and uh, having massive repressions. And they see that these political repressions will remain the main uh, tool of suppressing the popular vote. So the, these repressions will likely uh, 
will likely give an opportunity to Lukashenko to win, to win this election. But I think that many things that I have mentioned, many factors will not go away after the election. And it's very likely that the campaign will continue up to the 9th of August. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rigor, for that, uh, for that good introduction. It's a good bridge, Olga, to you on the question on how this is actually taken up by society itself. And it's often said about Belarus, perhaps incorrectly, that people are just less mobilized and are less likely to, to mobilize themselves also politically. But in your research, you've shown that also after COVID, there is more self-organization taking place, and it's sometimes even taking up a more political character. Could you elaborate on this? What are these things that have led to this change? Uh, to, and what do you think is now the level of mobilization of, of society? And how will this decision to deregister Babarika and for Lukashenko to win the elections, how will that impact that society? Thanks. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Indeed, uh, well, Belarusian society is normally considered to be rather political, right, and rather paternalistic. And um, according, for example, there was one survey in uh, 2017 that showed that only about 5% of people of Belarusians actually have any experience in community actions. And uh, when it comes to protest activities, to political activities on the street, this figure is even lower. And uh, when we're talking about paternalism, it's um, just high expected role of state, both in economy and in social life. And that is actually why the, the solidarity and politicization, politicization wave that you've just managed, that we've witnessed um, in the last two, three months, it, was, it came as a surprise for everybody, for experts, for people themselves, and of course also for the authorities. So maybe to give our audience the, the feeling what we're talking about, when we're talking about this high wave of politicization societies, actually the, for example, the unprecedented low queues of people also in small regional um, cities to give the signature for potential presidency candidates um, uh, and showing that they are against Lukashenko. So people were united under the slogan, anybody but one, anybody but Lukashenko, mm -hmm. right? And people were actually not afraid uh, to speak openly on camera against the president, appealing and asking him to leave um, this position after 26 years. So it's um, all this happened also during the pandemic, so we don't have to forget that it's still a pandemic time in Belarus, although it's not being seen as seriously by the state, it's still uh, there and people understand that. So uh, it was, it's, it has been unprecedented for the Belarusian uh, reality, so to say. And the other facts, the um, record just mentioned, uh, the, the number of signatures that Babarika has managed to gather online in one week, it was also the same amount as Lukashenko has gathered with the whole administrative um, um, resources that he has. Um, now, when we come, uh, when we come to the reasons, um, I, I personally see three main reasons for that, and I think all of them have already been mentioned. But we also just uh, specific, um, make them more specific for the public. When we're talking about the first reason for me is also state policy during the pandemic, and when we're talking about state policy, it is more or less the lack of consistent information about the pandemic at the very beginning. So people were nerfed, people were disorientated. Uh, they didn't understand why the, the you know, the illness, and the, the, the virus that is was considered to be dangerous in the whole world was not that in Belarus. So that led actually to the high level of distrust to authorities and also the level, well, the assessment of governmental measures um, as insufficient. There was a survey in March and April, uh, was an international survey, and it showed that Belarus took second place after Turkey when it comes to assessment of, of government and measures as insufficient out of, I think, about 60 states. So it was really huge level of distrust. Mm, and this exactly led to this high level of self-organization and solidarity in society. So we were talking a, a couple of months ago about the so-called people's uh, quarantine, so that people organize themselves for homework. They also limited their social uh, contacts without uh, waiting for the state to tell them doing so, right? And doctors were making self-made, publishing self-made videos for people on YouTube. And um, well, the, the, I think that one of the largest charity campaign in Belarusian history was named by COVID-19, which provided voluntary campaign, which provided hospitals with these uh, security um, items 
protection items for the doctors. And it actually united civil society, business, ministries, and also Belarusian diaspora. And it's also an unprecedented level of solidarity for the Belarusian society. And I have the feeling that this solidarity wave kind of, um, well, entered the political process because just uh -huh. coincided with the time, right? But the president himself, I think he's more or less, uh, he has, I think he has, managed to he has managed to 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 make people angry only by his expressions about the well um, by his arrogant i would say that it was really arrogant and humiliating speeches in terms of quite a wide social groups of societies i mean he was talking about the victims of the COVID, right people were waiting like 100, oh, 130 kilos, and he was talking about it. It's not possible to live with this weight, right? He was talking about um, people who were unemployed, lost his job, their jobs, then he was talking, <clears throat> he was telling people just, well, if you lost your job, just find a new one, right? Then he was blaming the doctors for infecting themselves, although it was not their fault that they did have these protection items. So just so within- It sounds very much like he's out of touch, right? I mean, the pandemic was affecting society and we, we only saw him in the Netherlands when he made statements that people can go and sit on a tractor or drink a, a shot of vodka, right? It wasn't taken seriously. I think that is more the, uh, the feeling. It right? was actually by the Ministry of Health. Of course, mm -hmm. they did some measures. And we, when we look at the mortality rate in Belarus, it's rather low. It's another question if it's true. But it's not about the, the mortality rate. It's about the information policy. Mm -hmm. Right. So if, if we add then the bad economic uh, self-perception of economic well-being of Belarusians to, Belarusians to that, there was really the, the most, what, just a second, uh, the biggest downshift, downshift in feeling regarding the uh, current economic situation, Belarusians. From the beginning, I think it was from the year 2000, so about in the last 20 years, right, so that people felt worse than in the last uh, 20 years during the spring. So it was more or less the coincidence that these factors, so to say, mm -hmm. time. Just to give you one figure, it was 40% of people who felt bad economically in December, and it was almost 60% um, already in March. Okay. So, and you add pandemic information policy to that, and of course you add new faces in politics. I already mentioned that. Maybe just another minute to uh, to explain why is it important that, that those faces are new, because they don't come from classical opposition. Um, the classical opposition structures in Belarus are um, neither popular nor well known uh, um, among well the broader society, and uh, this new faces in politics seem to me to have focused on two very different social groups. And I think it was also more or less the coincidence because one of the potential candidates, he was not registered, but he managed to mobilize people. This is this Tikhanovsky YouTube blogger who traveled through the country, gave people the microphone and uh, uh, showed on YouTube, showed the people that were not content with the local authorities. So these people live mostly in the regions, they might be less educated, they don't have good jobs or no jobs at all, they don't have enough money, and they're not content with the local authorities, and they're mm -hmm. tied to Andrew Lukashenko. Now when we come to the, um, um, the, the, the former high-profile regime performers as Babarika and Sapkala, they seem to have another audience. So these people should be better educated. Maybe they have international experience, but they also strive, they, they strive for reforms. They want changes. They're tired of the system of Lukashenko, which is not effective. So that means, as a conclusion, that means that two social, these different social groups would not necessarily uh, contact a lot with each other in their daily lives, but but the fact that well, well, due to the pandemic and due to the this electoral um, time in Belarus, they kind of found themselves on the streets and they united under the slogan "Anybody but one." And it's it's really a unique situation for Belarus. Yep. Thank you, Olga. Now it looks like Lukashenko is willing to use force, right? The police has actually been very active already in pulling people into unmarked uh, vans. Uh, regard, to what extent do you think they actually can? Because we've seen in other contexts, including in Ukraine, that repression can sometimes lead to a new wave of even larger protests. What's your assessment? Do you think they'll be able to retain control? What options does Lukashenko have in this, uh, in this regard? Or could he actually concede on some points and let go a little bit and maybe promise some reforms to give people a little bit more of a feeling that they're being heard? Well, on the one hand, we 
we don't know how many people will show up on protests. Mm -hmm. And we actually don't know how many protests will take place because probably it will be just one massive action in Minsk or probably there will be many protests across the whole country. Maybe even the protests will begin this week. So we still don't know many things to say how it will work out. And so it's, it will depend on the quantity of demonstrators and, and on the quantity of protests. On the other hand, we know that security agencies and law enforcement agencies are preparing for these protests and they showed uh, previously in 2010 and 2017 that they're actually well prepared for suppressing protests. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think that on the 9th of August, we can expect that internet will not be working in Minsk, that underground will not be working. So it's the whole logic of this election shows that the authorities are ready for some brutal decisions on the 9th mm -hmm. of August, before that or after that. So, so for now, I think Lukashenko is only considering closing up his system, like not having any reforms. And I already mentioned the fact that the prime minister has left his position. So I can theoretically imagine that Lukashenko after the election will start thinking about some reforms. But frankly speaking, it contradicts the whole logic of this election. Mm -hmm. Which is more stability, more of the same, actually. As yeah. Olga said, there's no positive agenda being uh, being put forward. Yeah, yeah. Olga, do you share this? If repressions do happen, do you think society will go back to to sort of waiting it out passively, or do you feel that there's been a market shift, also a generational shift, maybe, and people will no longer take it? What, what, how do you assess how hot the summer might get in Minsk and in the rest of the country as well? Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, repression is already happening. They have been happening mm -hmm. for some time already, right? The, the two or three popular candidate or potential candidates uh, already arrested, right? The persecution of bloggers and even administrators of um, telegram channels and like social media has played a, a very important role in this uh, grassroots mobilization during this electoral campaign in Belarus. We've also seen, um, well, the people who openly expressed their political views have been fired also, even from the state channels, which is also quite new for Belarus in, in such a quantity, at least. Uh, like people who used to work for television expressed their views, they've been fired. So these repressions already happened. For me, it's, um, it's another question. For me, the question is, um, and just want to tell you some interesting information about, I mean, who these people are, because you ask about the generation. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's really important point that Rahul mentioned that there has been, uh, we see a new generation of people. They probably didn't take part at the protest 2010, 2006. And I see at least, well, information that I have shows me that uh, these people, they are kind of, well, they used to be not politicized just a month ago, just two months ago. So these people don't have any experience of political activity, which has its pros and cons, actually, because, well, the negative part of that is that people don't really have, they don't really, they seem not really to understand the real nature of autocracy, how autocracies function. I mean, you can really have a good life in Belarus. You, you can have even, you can be well, well off. And if you don't engage in politics, you won't have any problems unless, I don't know, you have a very, very rich business and you have to share it with the state. But otherwise you should be okay with that. So the wave of shock coming from society now shows me that these people have not um, met any repressions till now so mm -hmm. i mean from the one hand this gives them this you know they, they're very brave and courageous and they still have hope to to use all the legal instruments in order to uh, to change uh, the, the power in belarus but from the other hand we don't know whether this wave of shock that they have now after these repressions after the tensions of people on the streets of people who were just sitting in the cafe and didn't do anything of course it can kind of stop their activity because they start feeling fear for their family for their job and so on so oh. um it's for me it's not clear i mean one uh, one thing is to gather signatures uh, to give their signatures uh, for potential candidates which is a legal procedure in belarus and some other thing is to 
come out in the streets uh, to protest against the regime, which is not sanctioned. All these um, actions will not be sanctioned, of course. So no. nobody really understands which part of the people, so to say, will prevail uh, if they will have more, um, uh, so to say, uh, more power, more if they will be more courageous to do that or not. Okay. Uh, so it could lead to further. Uh, okay, <laughs> <laughs> this is the, the, the last one. It could lead to further politicization and radicalization of the people that we see now. These new, newly politicized people, but at the same time, it could also discourage the current mood. The, the only possibility that I see might be some peaceful nationwide strike or I don't know election boycott but it something like this should have good organizers and most of the organizers are already detained and well the self organization is not uh, yet on this high this enough high level in order to organize something nationwide unfortunately wow. this might be but there's nobody to galvanize it in that in that sense. I, okay, um, that, that, that makes a lot of sense. Olga, in the interest of time, I have two more issue areas I would like to um, to go through because Tony has been on, on my screen. He's over here. He's been patiently waiting uh, to move into the next part, uh, which is about the international dimension of this. Uh, now, Rigor, you wrote an interesting uh, line that basically Lukashenko accuses Russia of manipulating these elections, of putting its candidates forward. Well, as the EU is now criticizing uh, Lukashenko for actually detaining these Russian puppets, right? Tony, if I could move to you for the geopolitical dimension, because the, we've seen a marked change in the relationship between the Russian Federation and Belarus. It was the closest relationship since the, the, the collapse of the Soviet Union, uh, but the, increasingly the Kremlin has ratcheted up the pressure. How do you see this? I mean, the Russian interest, first of all, in these elections, uh, and also the, the role Belarus plays geopolitically. Thanks. Oh, we have to unmute you, Tony. Wait. There you go. Yeah, got it. Uh, yeah. Yep. Okay, thanks. Um, yes, uh, well, especially since the Ukraine crisis, um, Belarus has been uh, balancing and hedging and trying to, well, defend its sovereignty uh, because there is a certain fear that they may be next uh, after Ukraine. Uh, to have their sovereignty and maybe even their territorial integrity uh, well limited or touched upon uh, by Russia. So they're balancing and hedging, trying to diminish their dependence on Russia in several spheres, um, energy, uh, economically, financially, and basically find new partners. And um, they have been trying to improve relations with the EU because the EU also has more or less rewarded uh, Lukashenko for not going along with Russia uh, in Russian's aggression, in supporting Russia's aggression against Ukraine in uh, the an annexation of Crimea. Um, so um, most of the sanctions uh, which were there previously have been lifted. There is more dialogue and Lukashenko tries to, uh, to well, have the EU to engage the EU in a kind of dialogue with the Eurasian Economic Union in a so-called integration of integrations, which basically means diluting the dependence on Russia. And um, uh, it has been doing the same uh, kind of balancing um, by posing itself as a neutral mediator, as a, a regional island of stability um, and uh, improving relations with the United States and even with NATO. Uh, so not to, to become a member, but to have constructive relations to to call for confidence and security building measures. Um, and uh, even when there are big uh, military exercises to say, well, we want to be a force of stability. We want to enhance transparency, uh, even if Russia doesn't like it. And, and one of the most uh, striking things also in this whole game of balancing and hedging has also been uh, uh, the improved relationship with China. So Belarus is now producing even military equipment together with China. So it doesn't depend only on Russia in that sphere. Uh, there is a big Chinese tech park uh, just outside the airport in Minsk, um, and they're trying to um, position themselves as uh, an entry point in, into the European Union of the Chinese Belt and Road Initiative. Uh, so these big corridors, um, trains and roads uh, rolling into Europe. So the main argument for all of this being 
diminish as much as possible the um, uh, dependence on Russia, diversify relations um, to, uh, well, to make sure that uh, Belarus itself could remain independent and sovereign uh, and, and, and protect, protects its, its own independent status uh, if they feel this is threatened. And of course, Russia has been ratcheting up pressure, uh, especially in the context of negotiations on the union state, which was a uh, well, thing which was on paper, which has been for many years on paper. And now Russia is trying to put more pressure on Belarus for closer integration in the context of the union state, uh, developing a roadmap, um, and otherwise uh, threatening to, um, well, to put higher taxes on, on the, the, uh, the oil and gas uh, on which uh, Belarus and big part of the Belarusian economy uh, depends. So this is whole game has been uh, going on for some time now. Uh, it, uh, it peaked a little bit at the end of last year. Um, we thought at the time then also that uh, maybe this was for President Putin a way out to, um, after finishing with his uh, fourth term uh, in office, to become then president of the of the Union State or to mm -hmm. find some new kind of uh, of function. Well, this seems to be off. Uh, he can stay on till 2036 if he wants to in in the Kremlin. Um, but uh, and this. Uh, President Lukashenko has been very good at, um, well, delaying this whole process. So it remains for, uh, uh, it remains um, very much still a paper tiger. Um, but he's feeling the pressure, especially in the energy sphere. Um, and there it's interesting to see how improved relations with, with even the US has led now to uh, the U.S. delivering oil to Belarus and uh, also countries like Azerbaijan. So they're trying to diversify their, their energy options. Um, and the U.S. is now for after, I think, uh, about 20 years, they are now uh, on the point of sending a new ambassador to, to Minsk. Um, I don't know whether the present situation would influence that, but um, they had over the past year, they had first a visit by... Um, John Bolton, uh, then uh, um, U.S. Uh, security advisor, and uh, uh, this spring it was uh, Pompeo, the Secretary of State, coming to Minsk. Uh, so um, it's very clear that for the U.S. this is also something that it's important to support uh, the sovereignty, territorial integrity, and as much as possible the neutral status of, uh, of Belarus. Yeah, that, of course, that is something Belarus wants, right? It wants to keep its options open. It doesn't want to put all its eggs into one basket. It doesn't want to become increasingly dependent on Russia, but the Kremlin may think otherwise. Now, Rigor, just quickly on the elections, to what extent is this argument of Lukashenko that the Kremlin is meddling in these elections and is trying to put forward a more pro-Russian candidate? To what extent do you see any core of truth in that? Is there, uh, is there an interest Russia has in getting a different candidate from Lukashenko to win? Thank you. Let me just mention three things here. First of all, is that uh, we can imagine what Kremlin wants to receive as a result of this election. The Kremlin wants to have uh, to have West imposing sanctions on Belarus. It wants that Belarus will destroy its links with the West. Kremlin wants Belarusian economy to be weak and over-dependent on Russia. It wants Belarusian society in depression. It wants Belarusian political system to be delegitimized. So basically, Lukashenko is doing everything to make you know, Kremlin happy. So that's why I really do not think that there is much point for them to intervene significantly into this election. The second point that I should mention is that, of course, there are groups in Russia that don't like Lukashenko. We can mention immigration groups that exist there. Of course, there are people inside Russian ruling class that don't like Lukashenko. Probably they generally do not like Belarus. We can just like mention former ambassador of Russia to Belarus, Mikhail Babish. But at the same time, I do not see that these people significantly intervene into this election because actually they're happy with the final result that they will, that they will have. And the third point that I should mention is, of course, possible links 
between Babarika Tsikhanovsky with someone from Russia. Uh, well, again, it's like the Belarusian authorities spend so much time accusing them of having some Russian links, of having some Russia support. But at the same time, you know, they didn't give any evidence so far. So I can imagine that actually there is no, there is no evidence that they really have some kind of support. Mm -hmm. But of course, at the same time, I should say that Babarika was the head of Belarusian branch of Gazprom Bank. So he, of course, he knows some Russians. So, and of course, <laughs> yes. so Tsikhanovsky, of course, spent some time in his life in Russia. So, mm -hmm. of course, they know, you know, they know Russians, but it, that doesn't mean, you know, that they are guilty of being like uh, uh, someone who is like has Kremlin's back in, in this life. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Very clear. Okay, Rigor, you mentioned something that triggered me to move on to the third part uh, in the interest of time, Tony. Um, Rigor mentioned what Kremlin wants is the West to put sanctions on Lukashenko, right? Uh, it would drive him further into Russia's arms. Now, that is, of course, exactly the dilemma that we're facing. As the EU, you want to uphold the human rights and you want to uphold your values and your principles. So if there's a brutal crackdown happening on peaceful protesters, you want to condemn this and, and put certain consequences in place. But the geopolitical logic is another one, which is keeping the channels open, offering Lukashenko a way out, offering him a chance of closer integration. Now, we saw in 2010, the EU did put sanctions in place, and it took them several years after the Ukraine crisis to, to lift those. I mean, how do you see this dilemma? I mean, it, it's a very tough one, isn't it? But how do you assess the EU's thinking on this matter at the moment? Yeah, I think that is a dilemma everyone also in Brussels in, in, in discussions on Belarus is facing. As you, so you don't want to, um, to give up on your values. You don't want to um, give up on the idea of free and fair elections to have those who are arrested released. Um, so the EU has been reacting to the present uh, crackdown with a number of uh, tough statements, um, including by Ursula von der Leyen and Sharon Michel directly after the recent, well, virtual online uh, Eastern Partnership Summit. Um, so giving some clear signals uh, that um, there are limits to what the EU could accept. So if uh, uh, Lukashenko wants to improve relations with the EU, uh, well, he has to do, he, he knows what he has to do. Um, and I think these messages have been, well, not very well received. Um, I saw only today there was a comment from the Belarusian foreign ministry uh, that they didn't really like the statements which the EU ambassador uh, in Minsk has been putting out, basically just repeating what von der Leyen and Charles Michel ha have said earlier. Um, and indeed, I mean, the EU what not very lightly um, uh, reinstall sanctions uh, and giving up uh, all this dialogue which uh, which has been accomplished which is very cumbersome but at least it is something it is moving forward it has produced some small results so the but on the other hand yes if this is going to be a real bloody crackdown on demonstrations, then, uh, well, the EU would have to think about, well, targeted sanctions, uh, making the sanctions smart so as not to affect the, the Belarusian population at large. Uh, but they will have to make this point. And, and, and the same for the US. I mean, there, I think here we are, we are on the same line. Um, and well, whether that's has any influence inside Belarus. Um, so not to let repression, let's say, pass certain stages, pass certain red lines. Uh, so using excessive violence or doing something like in 2010. Uh, and uh, Lukashenko has been threatening with, uh, with uh, a crackdown like in Uzbekistan, in Andijan in 2005. Yeah. So, I mean, if this would happen, you could expect more tough sanctions. But um, just, uh, I think, one or two years ago, when there was this, um, were also demonstrations and there were some arrests. Um, um, uh, there were also, from what I understood, there were also discussions inside the, um, uh, between authorities uh, in, in, inside Minsk. Uh, 
Um, there were also some who did not want to pass some red lines because they wanted uh, to improve relations with the EU. Uh, so then it was just some administrative detentions. Uh, well, whether they feel certain enough in their position to, to play the same game, so to have some repression, but not uh, let it um, evolve into a really violent uh, crackdown with blood and, and, and very uh, awful pictures on the television screens. Uh, I don't know. Uh, yeah. So, uh, but it could be part of their calculations uh, that they also know that if they don't want to lose the relations with the EU and the US altogether, and then be completely delivered to Russia, because I think the Russian interest here is just a weakened Lukashenko. Uh, so if he is uh, in a weakened position, it's uh, for the Russians more easy to, uh, to negotiate uh, a deal um, in favor of uh, what Russia wants in, inside the Union state or, or otherwise. Uh, but, but this will be a dilemma uh, which will, uh, yeah, we will um, face uh, in the coming uh, uh, in the coming weeks uh, to see whether there will be large-scale demonstrations uh, and what the reaction of the authorities is going to be. Yeah, okay, thank you, Tony. Uh, audience, uh, I see some of you have started to use the question option. Very good, please keep doing so. Uh, I have a couple more questions of my own and then we'll come to, um, come to you uh, because I wanted to ask Olga about uh, how the EU is perceived inside Belarus. We saw that the EU flag played a very important role in the Maidan protests in Ukraine because people were really positioning the EU as an alternative for Russia. And almost it was like a civilizational choice for some people. It was presented at least as such. Um, how does that play out in Belarus? Because I don't see that EU symbol being as potent there as it was in Ukraine. Um, do people regard the EU as an, as an alternative? Is it something they can mobilize and rally around? Or does it really not play much of a role of significance? Both. <laughs> <laughs> Both. Okay. Uh, um, well, the thing is, this perception of the European Union, vice versa, Russia, which is most often being asked during such a poll by the people, are normally being asked, do you feel yourself part of the EU, part of Russia, or do you want to be part of, or are you closer to the EU or to Russia? It actually depends a lot on the geopolitical climate and on the politics, and it can could be, it can actually be influenced um, by the media, by state media, and we saw it, um, uh, we saw it in the results of the polls uh, by an independent sociological institution, which was close 2016. Uh, so during this, um, let us say, sanctions period from the European Union, uh, well, the, the, the image of the um, European Union among Belarusians uh, was kind of worse. And during the wars with Russia, these oil wars, milk wars, whatever, um, the, the percentage, the share of people um, seeing themselves as, so to say, uh, the part of this Russian world, Russian culture and Russian politics also declined. So it can be influenced. But here is this also very important, as I already mentioned, uh, how do you ask the questions? I just give you two examples so that you see the difference in figures depending on how you ask the questions. For example, in opinion poll 2019, the question was, um, how should relations with Russia look like? And 75% of people said that Russia and Belarus should be independent states and should have friendly relations. So 75% mm -hmm. of people say Belarus should be independent of Russia. Then in the same year, you ask people which union should Belarus join? And then you're given the European Union or Russian, a union state with Russia. And then you have 54% of people who would can imagine joining this union with Russia and 25% of people um, uh, society joining the European Union. So if you are obliged to choose, then you would have different figures. But it, you know there is too much space for, for manipulation in this, no, uh, no. Uh, uh, which is really interesting and also maybe some kind of negative tendencies. This this feeling of identity is a kind of not that strong in, Bel um, in the Belarusian society. You can also see in the polls that um, when people are asked should Belarus remain independent? Uh, it was 2017 that 75, um, 75 of, um, percent of people told, uh, said yes, but about to, over 20 percent, it was really interesting. I mean, 20 percent is almost it's actually every fifth person in Belarus actually didn't have anything against being part of Russia 
part of Russian Federation or part of the union state with Russia. So um, there was another poll when people were asked uh, whether they feeling um, they're feeling to them they see themselves as a part of the so-called Russian world or Russian culture or the Western culture. Um, about 50% of people didn't actually know because they maybe it's a sign for us that people don't want to make this choice because they want to have friendly relations both with the Eastern and the Western world, so to say. Or maybe it's also a sign for um, showing us that people uh, in Belarus need a bit more time to understand who they are because the same poll showed that this local identity, vice versa, global identity is actually more important for people than Western identity, vice versa, Eastern identity. So maybe we should uh, start asking different questions to, you know, to, to, to get uh, different, different results. And when you ask me about the values, uh, how the European Union is seen within the Belarusian society, I think it's the question of marketing, of showing people what actually stands behind the European Union and what the EU is given to people so that they understand it's not something, you know, abstract about human rights and democracy and elections, which are far away, but what does it mean for people in their everyday life, what this financial assistance means to people. And the EU um, office has already uh, began a number of uh, very good information campaigns in Belarus. Uh, just give you to one figure, um, the, the, the share of people who didn't believe that the European Union is spreading values who are close to Belarusian values was about 30% 2018 and 40% 2020. So there was 10% more people starting to believe uh, that the European values are not that far away from the Belarusian values. I think okay. information policy is also here very important. Okay, thank you, uh, Olga. I'd, I'd like to move actually to a couple of questions that, that have come in from uh, from the audience. One is on um, the reliability of this polling uh, that you've just named. So I'm going to give the floor to Antoinette Dimitrova because it was also a question I had. This, how reliable are polls in Belarus? Antoinette, the floor is yours. Hello? Yep, hi yes. Antoinette. Yes, uh, Olka, uh, we have done a tiny bit of work also in Belarus uh, with survey experiments as part of an EU funded project. And uh, we found that uh, the way uh, the questions were asked and shaped made a very big difference to the actual answers. So I'm wondering, not so much, uh, I'm not suggesting that polling is in itself unreliable, but to what extent are the polls uh, produced uh, in specific circumstances or by official uh, uh, shall we say, polling agencies uh, that they influence this particular um, uh, perceptions of identity or of wanting to be uh, to belong to the union state that you were just mentioning. Thank you, Antoinette. Okay, on this data, but, uh, does that work in an environment like Belarus when people could be so worried to respond mm -hmm. to things like polls? Well, just once again to stress, the only independent sociological institute was NISEP or ISEPS in English, who was, was forced to close 2016. So till that time, we can rely on the polls that they um, uh, published on, they're still uh, available online. They were forced to close because their, uh, well, the, uh, the employees were persecuted by the state because the, well, not because, but many experts think because of the, the last published rating of Lukashenko, which was about on the 30%. Um, uh, support, electoral support for Lukashenko. That's the last figure that we have from 2016. Now, when we're talking about what has happened till then, of course, uh, of course, we don't have these institutions anymore in Belarus. But um, I mean, I mean, it's it's there is no reason not not to, to look for other surveys. Of course, it makes okay. difference whether the surveys are made. Um, so to say offline or online, most of the, uh, the surveys that has been made now, for example, during the pandemic, they were online from Satya, from Barak, but it's just the only source of information that we have and uh, we have to count on that information. Then- All right, no thanks, Olga. Olga, I gotta, I gotta move on. Uh, we have a couple more uh, questions, sorry about that. Uh, I have a very interesting one from Matthew uh, on the candidates that have been registered. Matthew, if you could have the floor, and I think for you, Rigor, this is an interesting one to, uh, to take up. That's you. Um, yes, hello everyone. Um, uh, we've seen a lot of the coverage today has been about who hasn't been registered. You'd almost get the impression there was nobody standing against Lukashenko, but in fact there were four other candidates opposing him, many of them from the traditional opposition you've all mentioned before. So 
How does the panel feel? Is there any chance of cooperation between the alternative candidates? Or are we going to see a round of infighting and dividing rule? Igor, if you could uh, take up this Thank one. Thank you. Thank you. I think it's very likely that Babarika's team and uh, Tsapkala's team will join the campaign of Svetlana Tsikhanovska. It seems very likely. And also, well, they will also all cooperate, almost all will cooperate on election observation. So it seems very likely that these people like Viktor Babarika, like Valery Tsapkala, they will stay in the campaign, but they will have different roles. And... In a way, you know, it's like taking into account that Svetlana Tsikhanovska is not a politician. So it will be easier for her that someone will join her. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Uh, Tony, I have one coming your way on the EU's options. And the question is from Hari, Hari Himmel, uh, who wants to draw a parallel with Armenia. Hari, go ahead. Mm -hmm. Hari, you have to unmute. No? Inge, if you could... Unmute Hari. Otherwise, yeah. I will ask the question. Oh, there you go, Hari. Okay, now. Yeah, I, I'm kind of, you know, I try to look at change processes in different countries in, well, this is what we call Eastern Partnership countries here, uh, you know, countries on the European side of uh, Russia. And you have Georgia, you have Ukraine, uh, but then you have Armenia, which, you know, had one country where you had the change process under popular uh, pressure. In done in a way that apparently had, you know, some degree or a reasonable degree of approval by the uh, Kremlin. This was also linked to the notion that Armenia could have both, you know, relatively close economic ties with uh, Russia through the Eurasian Economic Union and with the European Union. Could something similar, you know, be manufactured or stimulated around Belarus? Then, Tony, what do you think? Yeah, uh, well, it's a difficult one because I think for Russia, Belarus is much more important strategically, geopolitically than, than Armenia. Um, and in Armenia, they were very smart. Uh, it was, a, well, a homegrown revolution. Uh, and at the same time, they convinced all sides that, uh, that this was homegrown, that, that um, the EU or the West was not involved. And... and and so they, they could also convince Russia that this was the case. And so everyone left it to, um, left the, this velvet revolution to run its course. Um, yeah, I think uh, for, well, for Russia, Belarus is much closer by. It is uh, of much bigger interest. So I think they will be uh, watching it from another perspective. And, and as some of the speakers already said before, um, I think uh, they don't have to do, um, th their main interest in, in this election is that um, Lukashenko gets fundamentally weakened. So that's, uh, for a Rus from a Russian perspective, it's, uh, it's better to negotiate uh, than with a weakened Lukashenko. Um, or that indeed um, the regime will, with repression, shoot itself in the foot. And there will be all kind of uh, Western sanctions, and then uh, Belarus will have only one option left, which is Russia. Um, so this is played in a in a in a somewhat geopolitically in a somewhat different uh, it's a somewhat different ball game. Um, uh, what I think the EU should do is to keep um, all channels with civil society, um, also maybe with 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 opposition, open as much as possible. Uh, so recently there was a, um, after long negotiations, there was a, a visa facilitation and readmission agreement signed. It still have, has to be ratified, but I mean, this opens up also possibility for, uh, uh, for easier contacts uh, between, uh, between uh, peoples, between civil societies. Uh, so I think this EU should be very careful with whatever sanctions or not sanctions, whatever they are doing, um, reacting to repression in Belarus um, to make sure that these processes can go on. Uh, so, uh, and these, uh, di this dialogue uh, uh, can go on. 
Okay. Uh, thanks, Tony. I have two questions that are related to identity, one from Hugo and one from Kimberly, and I'm going to pull them together. Hugo, your question on whether or not Belarus has managed to forge an identity, I think was partially answered by Olga, already said not really. Uh, but Kimberly has a um, more detailed one on Belarusian language and identity. Kimberly, the floor is yours. We have to unmute you as well. Wait. Yeah, you go. Hang on. Yes. Yes, I think I'm unmuted now. You okay, are. thank you, Bob, and thank you, everyone, for the interesting discussion. Uh, my question is for Olga. Um, in the recent years, Lukashenko has been emphasizing a separate Belarusian identity. As opposed to his earlier years, he has been focusing more on the Belarusian language and culture to safeguard the nationhood and sovereignty. Um, to what extent does this resonate with the population? Does it play a significant role? Thank you. Thank you, Kimberly. Olga? Mm -hmm. Thank you for the question. It's indeed an, an important one. I think you are talking about the so-called soft Belarusization that we've seen, uh, well, at latest since 2015, but uh, quite a lot of um, experts also um, think it has started actually uh, even earlier. Um, well, indeed, after just to make it understandable for the audience, um, after winning against a more or less nationalist oriented candidate and gaining power in 1994, Lukashenko has started a so-called race Sovietization of the, I don't know, of the society of the history of the um, perception of history and mentality in Belarus because he felt the moods of people, Belarusians were not ready for becoming independent and they had a certain kind of nostalgia. They were nostalgic about the Soviet, lost in the Soviet Union. And that's why, well, some state symbols and flag were changed. Uh, now the, the, the modern Belarusian flag looks almost the same that it used to uh, look like during the Soviet Union. And this um, this um, agreement with um, about the Union state with Russia uh, came in the 1999. So it was a kind of the, the first phase of that. And then, um, since the beginning of the 2000s, well, the beginning of the, the 21st century, so to say, there was a try actually in Belarus, an attempt to find a special Belarusian ideology or identity, but actually it failed. Uh, they didn't manage to find something new, uh, so that, so to say, uh, to show Belarusians they're not part of Russia, so they're not Russians, but at the same time to move away from this uh, opposition with the national identity is a very important issue. So even Lukashenko admitted that it uh, didn't work. And then um, we've been observing this soft Belarusization. Lukashenko began uh, speaking Belarusian himself. He also was talking about the importance of the language and identity and national history. There was some shift or some, some change in the history history books, the more focus was uh, made on the period before Belarus um, and, mm, became part of the Russian Empire. And well, you know, this being Belarusian has become a kind of a fashionable, also in business. We've seen a lot of business initiatives and also Belarusian language courses for Belarusians, which seems a bit funny because I mean, <laughs> you live in Belarus and then you have Belarusian language courses um, just to give you the figures about uh, According to the last population census, we don't have uh, the data of the new one because it was only last year, so it was 10 years ago. Only 5% of people were speaking Belarusian language on a daily basis. So you can imagine um, in what condition the language is. So I would say it was really, it, it, it had a good reaction from society and from business. And there was a kind of depolitization of this national um, uh, values, uh, but uh, I mean, after this story with the with relaunching the, of the Union State began, Lukashenko lost this possibility to become a guarantor of the you know the development of national identity because it's it is seen now by the society as in danger as, as long as uh, he strives to sign this uh, to, not to sign it was already signed but to relaunch this Union State. Um, I see. Okay. All right. Thanks, Boka. Uh, I have more questions that we can answer, and we're reaching the end. Uh, so I'm just going to give. Uh, the floor at the very end to Rigor, who hasn't had a chance to comment on this dilemma. Rigor, you're looking at us from the UK now, uh, even though you are actually from Belarus. But if you can give us one point of advice on that dilemma that Tony sketched on, you know, whether or not the EU should very heavily uh, protest and condemn and sanction any human rights violations in the coming weeks, or if it should play the long geopolitical game. Uh, what kind of advice could you give us, Rigor, on that uh, devilish dilemma? Well, it's difficult to 
to give any policy advice because foreign policy considerations right now do not matter in Belarus. The Belarusian political system really cares just about surviving. And it, it seems it's that it's ready to pay any price. Hmm. So hmm. I really don't want to go right now into these sanctions topic. Probably it's very difficult to talk about it. And it's very, it, previously it showed that there are no smart solutions here. That there are pros and cons in every decision you make. But, you know, I think there are at least two things that you can do without even like talking about the sanctions. First of all, is just to decrease the cost of repressions in Belarus. I think that the West can really help with that, to help people pay fines, to help people pay for legal services. I think volunteers in Belarus confounded a lot of money, but at the same time, you know, volunteers sometimes just unable organizationally, financially to help everyone. This is why it's very important to strengthen human rights organizations who are professionally working with people, helping them. So I think it's very important for the West to, to help the civil society organizations that are working with that. And the second part is just to, to have an international solidarity. By the end of the day, well, Belarus is not in the, in the priority list of the West because of the pandemic, because of the EU Belarus uh, dialogue because of the Belarus role in regional security. So it seems very unlikely that the Western countries will really, really be very, very, you know, decisive in their actions towards Belarus. Although that, of course, will depend on the violence. If Belarusian authorities will be violent on the 9th of August, sanctions are very likely but anyway it's the solidarity national solidarity is very important because foreign policy considerations are not important now but they will be important after the election when Lukash when and if Lukashenko feels secure and then they will and then the Russian authorities will start thinking how they should improve relations with the west so that's why it's very important that the west will show that Belarus matters for them well, thank you very much, Rigor. In order to show to, that Belarus matters, the West also needs to know about Belarus. That is one thing that we've tried to do with this webinar, to contribute to that. Uh, and I'd like to thank uh, our three experts. There's no applauses in Zooms, but if there were, I would give you a, an applause. Thank you very much for your time and for spending uh, this hour with us, sharing your knowledge with us on this really thorny question, actually, on what the West can do about, uh, about Belarus and what we might expect in the summer ahead. I also want to thank the very patient YouTube audience that couldn't join in the debate. Please do register on our website. I'd love to have you in the Zoom next time. And of course, a big thanks to everyone in the Zoom for the good questions that you've asked for your interest. Uh, stay in touch with us with the Klingendal Russia and Eastern Europe Center. Next webinar, 10th of September on security issues. I wanted to ask Tony all kinds of questions about the military role of Belarus, didn't manage to, uh, uh, to get to that, but we can discuss the security and the military aspects uh, in a future webinar uh, after the summer break. But for now, thank you very much and have a good day. Thank Goodbye. You. Thank you. Bye.